so first of all, thank you all for coming um, to listen to us talk about our trip to China. Um, I want to thank Dr. Montiel because she took a lot of time and energy to put us all together, make sure we could go, and then make sure we were all safe while we were over there. So um, if we could just yeah. um, So I'm Aubrey Kemp. I'm a student in the graduate program studying computer mathematics education. Um, I'm Michael, I'm an undergrad student here, and I'm also the president of the math club. Oh yeah, I'm the president of the American Mathematical Society graduate student chapter. Um, so to start off, we're just going to show you some pictures of the campuses that we visited. One of them we were staying at overnight, and the other one we would go to for our mathematical music theory class. Um, so we'll just go through some of these. This is uh, one of the views from the dorms where we stayed. We were on the 13th floor, so we got a really great view of just the buildings. And you can kind of tell, and you'll see in later pictures too, that the city just kind of keeps on going on and on and on. And this is outside of Shanghai, but close enough to where um, you get the idea of the city. And this is the door that we were staying in. Uh, we stayed on like the 13th floor, so we had a pretty good view of everything from there. The campus where we stayed was very beautiful. We had, for example, this pond was just kind of running right through the middle of it. Um, a lot of people would be outside doing Tai Chi at any time of day. Um, and then, like I said, the rest of the campus was, there was just so many pretty things to look at. And that's a walkway. And uh, this is the group uh, walking around campus. Uh, it's uh, pretty large, so it took us a while to figure out how to get around and whatnot. But, um, uh, one of the presentations today that you're going to hear is about clapping music. So just to give you some background, while we were there, um, we studied at East China University um, of Science and Technology. And so we were in a classroom, and you'll see the other campus in a minute, but we were in a classroom and there were nine of us from Georgia State and 40 Chinese students. Um, so we were able to interact with them and everything. We split up into five different groups to study five different things with mathematical music theory. One of them was clapping music. So this, um, we were practicing, well we, some of the students were practicing a little bit of the clapping music. And so you'll hear more about that in a minute. And this is the group at the very front entrance of the campus and they have like this really cool lion statue in the back, as you can see. This building, um, we took not only were we able to take the mathematical music theory course, but we were, had the opportunity to participate in a, um, in a Chinese culture class on the campus where we actually stayed. So this is the building where we had our Chinese culture class. Um, and and uh, this is the professor, actually. Her name's uh, Yang Jingwan, and she's a pretty well-known uh, politician and professor in Shanghai. And she did a really good job at uh, giving us some basic history and, uh, of China and whatnot, and Shanghai culture. Just a few more things from the campus. Um, there's a really wide open lawn. A lot of um, students on the campus would go and exercise in the mornings and throughout the day. But I thought it was really interesting that these bushes, you know how sometimes here we'll see bushes shaped in words, but over there they also do that with Chinese characters. And so I just thought, it, I don't know, it's really interesting. There were a lot of similarities between our culture and their culture, but there were also obviously many differences. Big Ferris wheel near our door. <laughs> so just some, some few more views from our dorm. It was just really beautiful, so we couldn't not keep it. Keep in mind, pictures. this is like uh, 20 minutes outside of downtown Shanghai, so it just gives you an idea of how big the city is. So on the days where we would study mathematical music theory, we would take a one-hour bus trip over to the other campus, which is right next to the East China Sea. And so that campus was really wide open. Um, you could, you could tell you were right next to the sea. It was slightly more humid and you could just kind of feel it. Um, the library is what's behind us in this picture and you can't really get the magnitude of it, but it was huge. It was just windows all over the place and a lot of really awesome historical um, like artifact type of things on the inside. But again, the campus was really wide open. Um, this is a picture of classroom. the, the classroom. Um, our classroom was somewhere. But um, like I said, you can tell in the background of this picture that it's very wide open, it's very relaxing, which is why Gabrielle is taking a little cat nap. Mm -hmm. And this is our group uh, in front of our classroom, just waiting for class to start. So when we got there on the first day of class, one of the professors from the university um, introduced Dr. Montiel, which is what we will play right now. So in the morning, two 
weeks starting from today, yeah, Dr. Montiel will introduce us some aspects of mathematics music theory. And in fact, uh, this is the second time right? yeah. that uh, Dr. Montiel uh, has given us this course. The last semester, she gave this course to seniors and postgraduates in our department of mathematics. Yeah, besides, uh, uh, there are there's a lot of Chinese students in our class. Also, there's seven of us in the university. They will also take part in yeah, this course. So you are expected to actually interact with them yeah, in the class as well. So, okay, now yeah, let's more play real on the doctor material. So, again, like Michael said, this is pretty much the view of the classroom, and like we said earlier, there are nine of us studying from Georgia State and then 40 other Chinese students from the university. And this is on the first day of class, Dr. Montiel was starting to introduce some of the information. And uh, now we're going to uh, begin with the first presentation, uh, Maximal Evenness and Euclidean Rhythms uh, by Emily Mott. Hi guys, my name is Emiliano and I'm a graduate student, music student from the School of Music, obviously. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to talk to you about maximal evenness and Euclidean rhythms. Alright, so what do the uh, most used world rhythms and an ancient algorithm described by Euclid have in common with SNS accelerators in Euclid physics? Well, the answer is patterns distributed as evenly as possible. Now, back in Shanghai, we proposed a problem to the class related to SNS accelerators. Um, time is divided into intervals, and in the case of SNS, 10 seconds. And during some of these intervals, a gate is activated by a timing system that generates signals. Now, this is the problem we proposed. The problem for a given number n of time intervals and another given number k less than n of signals is to distribute the signals as evenly as possible among the intervals. Now, a mathematician by the name of Jorkland represented this problem as a binary sequence of k1s and n minus k zeros, where each number represented a time interval and the ones represented the signals or represent. Now, we can summarize it as the following. You construct a binary sequence of n bits with k1s such that the k1s are distributed as evenly as possible among the zeros. Now, the problem turns interesting when k and n, sorry, k and n are relatively prime. So now uh, let's see how Jorkland's algorithm works. In, uh, in this bar right here, we have uh, 7 ones and 12 bits. And 7 and 12 are relative primes. If we place the 7 ones to the left, which they are here, we get a remainder of 5 zeros, or 5 columns of zeros. Now if we look at what uh, what's written in red, we have, the, uh, we have this translated in terms of the Euclidean algorithm. So on top is the Jorkland way and then Euclidean way right here. If we take the remainder of five zeros and place them underneath the ones, it gives us a new remainder of two columns. Uh, as you can see, Jorkland's algorithm has more steps than the Euclidean algorithm, but at the end, when we get a remainder of one or zero, according to the Euclidean algorithm, we stop. Now, we read the sequence starting from the number at the top left we go down the columns, we begin again at the top of the second column. We see that uh, the ones are distributed as evenly as possible, given that 7 does not divide into 12. So now uh, we can see this translated in horizontally here, for a more clear picture. Any rotation of this distribution will be maximally even, and there are 12 possibilities of a maximally even distribution. Now here's a video of uh, uh, my other group member, Aloli, who's going to be with us today, uh, socializing or no, not socializing, talking, <laughs> talking with uh, students about what we're doing. Evenness principle states 
you distribute the K notes, which we called before the K1s, among the musical pulses, which we called before the end time intervals, as evenly as possible. Now, we have, a, we have this rhythm of seven notes and 12 pulses. You can tell that that's not evenly distributed. But if we follow Jorkland's algorithm, then this new rhythm does have its notes evenly distributed. And that rhythm is the one that we worked on before. So just, it's just in a different notation. Let me just clap you the rhythm twice so you can see what it sounds like. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. So it's a pretty cool rhythm. Um, now, uh, since Jordan's algorithm is basically the same as the Euclidean algorithm, I guess we could call these rhythms Jordan rhythms, but they are known as Euclidean rhythms and denoted by E of K and N, where K refers to the number of notes once and N is the number of pulses, time intervals. Now, here's a video from actually with the day of our presentation. Actually, what we created, we created a video to show the relation between the Euclidean and the Jordan. And that's what he created. It's actually a 23 by 9, which we did not write on the So he, one of the students created his own rhythm using 33 and 9. Which is all right. So now uh, I'll I'll play the rhythm that the the, the student created there. Now the way the way I did it was I played uh, the ones with my with my left hand and the zeros with my right hand to give it more of an actual pulse. So I, I have drumsticks, so you'll hear exactly what I'm doing. Okay. All right. That's it. That's it. Transformation too. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, me and Gabriella, who's also an undergrad math student here, and Daniel Nolan from the School of Music, did our uh, project on transformation theory, which pretty much connects group theory with mathematical music. Uh, now, modern mathematical, mathematical music theory applies group theory to pitch systems by considering intervals between pitches as transformations. And in our case, we study TI and PLR groups, what they represent musically and mathematically, and the isomorphism between the two groups. Uh, to give some background here, the tall pitches of the modern musical system can be represented by the first seven letters of the English alphabet, and where each letter represents a different frequency. And you can see via this picture at the bottom that it's convenient to represent it by Z12. Uh, the set of notes played simultaneously are known as chords, and we considered a group of chords known as triads, which are three notes played simultaneously, and we studied major and minor chords. Here we have the mathematical definitions of a major and minor chord, as you can see below. And we let N be the set of all 24 major and minor chords. Now, uh, in music theory, transposition refers to the process of translating a pitch or set of pitches by a constant interval. And you can see how we can express this translation mathematically applied to a chord. Um, and then similarly, we can define inversions as such. And the set of all uh, transpositions and inversions forms a group under composition, as known as the TI group. And here's a geometrical interpretation. Um, transpositions, you can see, can be represented as rotations of a triangle through 12 points equally distributed in a circle, where the three vertices of the triangle represent all the pitches of the triad. And here is the geometrical interpretation of inversions. And in this case, we apply it to C major. Now, the T and, T and I transformations have math, musical, group theoretic, and geometrical interpretations, which our group studied. In addition to these transformations, we also studied the parallel leading tone exchange and relative functions applied to the elements of M. 
Now, you can see the definitions down here. We say two pair triads are parallel if they have the same letter neighbor of opposite parity. In other words, if it's major or minor. Uh, two triads are relative if they're of opposite parity, and if the root of the minor triad is three semitones below the root of the major triad. And then leading tone exchange, the big triad is also of opposite parity, and the root of the major triad is replaced with its leading tone. And here you can see we can represent these uh, trans or these functions mathematically um, applied to major and minor chords. You can see P of a minor chord is as such P of X and then P of a uh, major chord P of Y is different. Uh, most importantly, we studied the isomorphism between these two groups, which can be shown explicitly and also can be proven by the fact that the two groups have the same, uh, same group presentation. Here you can see we define uh, the isomorphism explicitly, where we represent the elements of PLR uh, in terms of the group's generators. And here's some pictures of representation. Uh, you can see me, Gabrielle, and Daniel. Daniel helped give us some uh, musical background to the students, which definitely helped a lot. And uh, you can see the Chinese students presenting their part of the project. You see Gabriella presenting her part. And um, it was a good project to work on. They enjoyed it. And so now we'll go on the symmetry and freeze patterns, which is done by Robin. Hello, everyone. I'm looking at so many people here today. Thank you for coming out again. Uh, my name is Robin Baidia. I'm a PhD student in mathematics here. I'm studying under Dr. Montiel. <coughs> Uh, my group, which this is of uh, Drake Kennedy, as well as several Chinese students, studied symmetry and freeze patterns. In music. So let's just start off with uh, what we're working with, the domain. A musical plane is essentially just a subset of R2 that has musical meaning in a given context. You can define that in several ways, depending on context. So for example, you can define a minimum unit of time to be a unit along the x-axis. We can define a minimum harmonic interval to be a unit along the y-axis and we end up with this lattice on the right. And so now if you take a non-empty subset of this musical plane, then you can study the symmetry group of that set. <clears throat> Essentially, it's a set of all permutations of that set. And so we call that the symmetry group. So this is just one example of a musical object with this symmetry group. Um, moreover, if that symmetry group happens to have a non-trivial translation in it, then, uh, and if every translation is either horizontal or every translation is vertical, the musical object is called freeze pattern. So we focused on uh, horizontal freeze patterns. Freeze pattern. Freeze. <laughs> The article that my group presented uh, was an article called Symmetry and Musical Transformations uh, in Musical Plane, uh, written by V. Hart. And there was an assertion that I found a little bit strange, and that was that the author decided to restrict her attention to isometries that can be decomposed in this form, where we have vertical reflection, a horizontal reflection, and a translation, and that's not all isometries. So uh, later I'll talk about maybe a motivation for that particular assertion. But if we do take the assertion of the author, then we find that there are seven types of musical freeze patterns. And we're using John Conway's footprint analogies to identify them more easily. And so this is one of them, uh, the hop freeze pattern. The hop freeze pattern is a symmetry group that's generated by just a horizontal translation. And the symmetry group is isomorphic to the entrance. Here's another freeze pattern. It's called the step freeze pattern. The symmetry group is generated by a glide reflection and that glide reflection is generated by a translation and a horizontal reflection. That symmetry group ends up being isomorphic to Z as well. <coughs> and the third one, the jump freeze pattern, this one is generated by a translation as well as a horizontal reflection. And there are four other freeze patterns. Uh, three of them have symmetry groups that are isomorphic to D infinity, and one of them is isomorphic to D infinity cross Z mod two Z. So the students that we were working with tended to have a minimal musical background. And so I thought, well, how are we going to introduce 
these uh, students to these types of musical objects. Well, I thought, well, why don't we just start off with subsets of the Euclidean plane and show how we can take a finite object, apply transformations to it to, until we get an infinite object, and show that actually has a series group that we desire. And uh, so there we go, it's explaining how to generate such an object. <clears throat> so explicitly, I, uh, I showed the group, this particular group pattern. So this is the finite object that I started with when I applied transformations to it until I get an infinite pattern that has a certain symmetry group, in this case, the hop symmetry. So let's just listen to what that, means, to what that sounds like. In other words, horizontal, horizontal translation is just a repetition. And so each of the students generated a particular subset of the plane that has a given freeze pattern. So I'm just going to show you three of the patterns that were generated by students. This is a dizzy hop freeze pattern generated by students. On the top, you see what students generated, and on the bottom is what Drake and I uh, translated to music. definition in particular of the Euclidean norm and then an isometry that is relative to that norm. We need to start off with isometry sort of we want to talk about symmetry groups of objects in the time. So as I mentioned earlier, for my personal project, I decided to focus on the assertion that the author made, which was to restrict our attention to certain types of isometry. But here's a well-known theorem in algebra that every isometry of R2 can be decomposed this way where you have rotation, reflection, and translation. And for some reason, the author wanted to restrict her attention to these isometries that can be decomposed as a vertical reflection, horizontal reflection, and translation. I thought, why is that the case? And what I found, after thinking a long time, was that actually there is an equivalent condition that we can impose on that isometry. And uh, this is what I ended up proving for my project. Essentially, if you have an isometry that can be decomposed in this way, then it ends up not only preserving Euclidean distance between any two points, but also horizontal and vertical distance. And it works conversely as well. If you have an isometry that preserves horizontal and vertical distance, it ends up being able to be composed in this way. So this is the formal mathematical presentation of uh, my theorem, and so I proved it for now this <laughs> just proved it. <laughs> it took a while. No, yeah. <laughs> now this doesn't exactly explain the motivation of the author, but I thought that it might be a starting point for further investigation in the area. And uh, my group partner, Greg Kennedy, focused on uh, distance functions right there. <laughs> uh, he focused on the distance functions, in particular in the context of blues. So here's a well-known graph to any music theorist. Essentially, each point in the graph is a major scale. And we connect two major scales. There exists a simple modulation between those two scales. This is the mathematical formulation of what a modulation is. So, but these are only simple modulations. And in a sense, they're only applicable to maybe music from the classical period. Whereas now, music is much more complex. And modulations are accordingly more complex. So for his paper, Drake thought, what possible generalizations are there of the graph that he saw on the previous slide? Can we generalize it to seventh chords, 
Triangle inequality, right? You have, to check, you have to check the distant function satisfies the triangle inequality first, right? So one of the generalizations that he was suggesting, and we were testing it on the subway. <laughs> And there's Dr. Chen in the back, right? Dr. Chen is sitting down. <laughs> yeah, right. We had a lot of train rides to get around this huge city, of course. So that's my presentation. And now Aubrey Kemp will present her work on the next project. Hi, everybody. I'm Aubrey Kemp. Um, again, like I said, I'm a graduate student in the math department. Um, so I worked on the Hexcord Theorem. Um, I worked with two of the Chinese students. We gave our presentation um, based on a proof of the Hexcord Theorem by Juan Iglesias. But what I'm going to do is go through an example of how we can apply the Hexcord Theorem and kind of see how it works before we do that so we can give some more context to the problem. So this is my group that I worked with. Um, they were really great. I still actually keep in touch with one of them. So. Um, the Hexcord Theorem First, we want to start off with defining a few things. The first one is a hexachord. What is a hexachord? Um, that is a series of six notes. So if we consider a hexachord where the notes are distinct, and then we look at the complement of that, we will end up having 12 distinct notes. And this is what we call a dodecaphonism. So we are going to be looking at dodecaphonism when we're talking about the hexachord theorem. Um, this is an example right here. This is Jacob's Ladder. And if you look carefully, all of those notes are actually different from one another. So we can use this when we're looking at the hexachord theorem. Um, the inventor of dodecaphonism, originally when he started looking at this, um, we look at a hexachord of six distinct notes and its complement. And if you look at the distance between the notes and the intervallic content, it ends up being the same, which is actually very interesting. So we are going to go back to Jacob's Ladder in a minute and, and check to see how that works. But in layman's terms, the hexachord theorem says that if you consider the hexachord of a group of notes and its complement, the histograms represented by the intervallic content of each will be the same. So, first off, as Michael stated earlier, it's very easy um, to represent the 12 different frequencies in an octave by Z12. So we will convert those then to um, the integer 0 through 11. Now, like I said, we're going to go back to look at Jacob's Ladder. Um, so here I've labeled the first six notes, and you can see that they are all different. What we end up doing is connecting those notes that correspond on um, our circle that we're using here. Next, what we want to do, like we've been talking about, is look at the, the distance between these notes. So we end up counting how far or how long it takes to get around the circle to get to the following note. So first we're going to look at C sharp and E. So if you see here, between C sharp and E, we've had gone three vertices around the edge, and then the, the distance between the two is three. We continue to do this over and over again until we get all of them. But if you notice here, the distance between C sharp and G sharp, um, we could go that way around the circle, but then we get seven. We want to keep it the shortest distance, as we do a lot of the time in graph theory. So we're going around the other side of this, and we actually have a distance of five. Once we do this a lot, we end up getting something like this, where we have all of the intervallic content um, displayed on here. And then we construct a histogram based off of that. And you can double check it, but it is the right histogram. Um, so now what we want to do is consider the complement, since that's what the hexachord theorem talks about. So in blue is the original hexachord, and then in red is its complement. So now we're going to do the same with that. But in, I'm not going to go through the basics of it since we already know how to construct it. So again, this is how we're going to um, make this histogram. And now to revisit the original histogram we just looked at, I'm going back and forth now. Do you believe me that they're the same? <laughs> All right. So we have indeed seen, at least with Jacob's Ladder, that the hexachord theorem is true. Um, so again, the hexachord theorem says if you consider the hexachord of a group of notes and its complement, the histograms represented will be the same, which means the intervallic content will be the same. Um, this is a part of our presentation. So, like I said earlier, we, we presented the proof by Juan Iglesias, but obviously this has been studied by a lot of different people. It started off in crystallography, um, and the problem of determining a set of points based on their distances arose. And so that's, it started in crystallography, then it kind of moved into mathematical and music terms. And so, again, here's Juan Iglesias' proof, or it's discussed here. 
but it eventually went over into music and studied by a lot of other mathematicians and mathematical music theorists as well. So it's a, it's a pretty popular um, popular topic of conversation in the mathematical music world. And here's some more of us presenting. <laughs> Okay, so as I said, we looked at Juan Iglesias' proof, which is of the discrete version of the hexachord theorem. Um, if you saw on that last slide, um, we were writing the words black and white all over the board, and his proof um, starts off with coloring the first hexachord either black or white, coloring its complement the opposite color, um, and then analyzing the distance between consecutive notes that are the same color. And eventually, once you do that, you can get a, we find the proof, um, has that the consecutive distances between the same color notes are the same, which means that the intervallic content would be the same. It's a very, very, very brief overview of that proof. <laughs> but again, here's some more so you can see the black and white. And then finally, as I said, Juan Iglesias' proof is of the discrete case of the hexachord theorem, um, which would insinuate and it is true that there is a continuous case. And actually, um, we did read a paper on that as well, but it's very interesting, so look it up. <laughs> um, so that was the hexachord theorem. Now, <laughs> so now we're going to hear about clapping music, which was um, going to be presented by Alana. <clears throat> Hello everybody. My group studied a particular piece of music called clapping music, which was composed by Steve Reich in 1971. Um, he was actually sitting um, at a cafe in Belgium with some friends and they saw a flamenco performer and Steve Reich thought to himself, wouldn't it be interesting to create a piece of music that needed no instruments beyond the human body? And that's just what he did. <laughs> um, he wrote a piece called clapping music, which whose only instruments are hands. <laughs> um, basically, this is a piece, as you can see, the this is the first performer's um, piece, uh, script, <laughs> and this is the second performer's. Um, if you'll notice, the first performer plays the same rhythm throughout the entire piece, while the second performer starts off playing the same thing as the first, um, but it varies slightly throughout the piece, and then this is particularly cool because at the very end they end up clapping in unison. Um, this, we were interested in wondering how this particular pattern was chosen. As a musician, you would hear this pattern and notice there's a sense of balance throughout the piece between the resulting variations as they create and release rhythmic tension. But as a mathematician, you hear this piece and think, once defined, the pattern does not change, it just shifts to the right. I wonder what mathematical questions are suggested by this piece. So, um, as I said before, the first performer plays the same rhythm throughout the piece, so I wanted to take a look, a closer look at the second performer's um, rhythms. Uh, so here I have represented the first three measures of the piece um, ge geometrically. Um, as you can see, oh, so the pattern is uh, three claps, two claps, one clap, two clap, as I've represented here, three, two, one, two. Um, you'll notice that the second uh, measure, the second, the the second variation, is essentially the same, is structurally identical to the first one, it's just sort of been rotated an eighth note to the right, um, or geometrically 30 degrees. Uh, um, same with the third. Okay, so how could we come up with a rhythm like this one? All right, well we, we know that we want, we have a 12 beat measure, and we want to put eight claps in there, which means we're gonna have four rests. So initially we have 495 possibilities. Um, so musically, we think about how we can narrow this down to the final piece he chose, and so we say, oh, well, maybe we don't want to start it with the rest, which knocks several options out of there. Maybe we don't want to have two rests in a row or two consecutive numbers of claps in a row. Um, so mathematically, we seek to impose an equivalence relation on the 70 patterns, which the 495 are narrowed down to by a lemma I'm about to show you. <laughs> um, Okay, so again, if we regard this piece as a piece of music with no beginning that just cycles endlessly, we could regard as equivalent any two patterns that produce the same piece. For example, if you hear somebody clap the pattern one, two, one, two, one, two long enough, and you hear somebody else clap the pattern two, one, two, one, two, one long enough, they're gonna sound the same. They're cyclic. 
In other words, two patterns are equivalent if they're cyclic permutations of each other. So um, my group uh, read and um, studied a particular essay called Mathematical Clapping, Mathematics of Clapping Music by John Hack. And he um, called our attention to this particular lemma, which is mathematically how we narrow down the number of possible rhythms. And this is a video where I'm explaining, where I'm discussing it, that, um, the particular isomorphisms and lemma uh, mathematically, and how, basically just talking about how we can narrow the 495 down um, to 70, and then eventually, as you can see here, down to 10. Okay, now that we're down to only 10 pa possible patterns, we can look at them on a more individual basis, and rather than looking at all 495 and rolling some out, and all 70, now we only have 10, so it's more reasonable to actually look at them individually. So, let's see, let's, just, let's say we don't wanna have, oh, okay, right, so I mentioned, or maybe I didn't mention, but the piece um, is composed in 13 measures. Um, the two performers start off playing identical rhythms, and by the end, they're playing back in unison again. So we want to rule out, so these are our 10 that we have narrowed it down to. We want to rule out the um, patterns that won't make it all 13 measures, that are essentially going to bring the two clappers back in unison before the piece is over. Um, we want it to last 12, 13 measures. So we rule out 3, 1, 3, 1, and 2, 2, 2, 2. All right, then we say, okay, well we want to rule out all the patterns that have consecutive numbers of claps. So as you can see, we ruled out any pattern that has two consecutive uh, numbers of claps in a row. So finally, we're down to four, one, two, one, and three, two, one, two um, as our only possibilities. And we believe that three, two, one, two was chosen out of those two because it, because it is the more um, evenly distributed rhythm of the two. Um, so here's it again. And this is a video of Drake and Emiliano from the music department performing the piece. So you can hear how cool it is. you see these 
gorgeous, lush mountains and wide open sky, and then you turn around and you look the other direction, you see all this skyline, all this city. So it's, it's pretty cool, it's a nice blend of city and country, and it's kind of like something for everyone. <laughs> um, here's a couple of us <laughs> on the boat. That's a Lodi, she's in the math department, she's um, more beautiful mountains and I mean, this is like pretty far outside of Shanghai, and that's what the skyline looks like. So, like when I drive to school, I drive through Buckhead, and I say, "Oh wow, what a skyline!" And then I see Atlanta, and I say, "Oh, what a big skyline!" But this is like kind of country <laughs> for Shanghai. Give you a taste of how developed this place is. Um, this is more of our delightful boat tour. This is a homie we met along the way. <laughs> And we also took a little excursion to a really beautiful outdoor kind of spiritual temple cave place um, with lots of really gorgeous carvings. I think it's from the 13th century. It's really old, just like really old <laughs> and really cool. Um, we also saw temples. Temples are pretty much a, uh, a steady occurrence if you're going to walk around China and explore, or at least around Shanghai and explore the cities. Odyssey's and Tales are beautiful. Um, my favorite part of Hangzhou was we got to go to a tea estate. It was a dragon well tea estate. Um, and it was my first time um, learning anything about how tea grows or how it's harvested or how it's roasted or packaged or anything. It's just really cool. Those are all tea plants that are just terrible. And we got to spend 10 minutes in the life of a tea harvester <laughs> and wear these awesome hats. <laughs> We also took a day trip to Suzhou, another city that's close to Shanghai, and uh, we visited a place called Lion Grove Garden, uh, which was a beautiful, uh, beautiful complex of buildings as well as, uh, of course, a garden. And whereas Hangzhou is known for its natural beauty. Suzhou is known for its man-made beauty, and in particular, in the Lion Grove Garden, there was a notable uh, labyrinth, a rock labyrinth that was completely carved, and this is kind of this style of sculpture. And walking through this labyrinth always got lost. In it. it was a huge labyrinth, and it's just like walking through a natural etching, natural etching come to life. And uh, since my group, Drake and I, since we studied symmetries in class, I thought that it was particularly interesting that. Essentially, every single window in Suzhou was different, and I could find essentially every symmetry that I studied in class in the windows at some point. Of course, there are asymmetrical windows as well, and more naturalistic ones, but uh, I became a little bit of a window enthusiast. <laughs> I went around Suzhou, and I also a calligraphy enthusiast. I got my name written in calligraphy in the Suzhou. That was Suzhou. Yeah. That was Suzhou. We're going to end with um, just staying around the central location of Shanghai, what we did while we were there. Um, on the first day, we were able to go visit um, one of the Buddhist temples, so it was kind of like cultural immersion right away once we got there. But this is actually in People's Square, um, and this is obviously the group of us that went, uh, minus Bernardo, which he had to go, I think. But um, we took, this is um, Mac or ex-Mac tutors um, here, but we were able to take this big bus tour around Shanghai and see a lot of the things. So this is right here, one of the Buddhist temples. We actually didn't go in this one, but you can see it appears to be made out of gold. But even the building behind it, it has like golden windows. So this whole city, no matter where you looked, was just beautiful everywhere. Um, this is one of the, these are really, really ginormous um, Buddha statues. Um, this is a picture you'll see in a minute, um, and this is actually, the buildings you see, the structures are from one of the pictures on the flyer, actually. But this is the Pearl Tower, and you'll see that a lot, a lot in the next few pictures. But this is near People's Square. You can see this whole wall has flowers all over it, and you can just see the magnitude of the city. To it. it just looks huge, and it is huge. But this is at the top of the Jin Mao Tower right now. That's in the, one of the top, I think, one of the top five tallest towers in the world. Um, so we are very, very high up, and I know it's cloudy that day, but you can kind of just see the city just goes on and on and on. And here's the Pearl Tower again, so you get another picture of that. Here's some of us in front of that flower wall. The boys 
Um, there was a French concession, um, which was basically just this huge marketplace where you can go and like barter with people and buy things. Um, this man is not part of our <laughs> But we actually ran into another study abroad group from the biology department, and so th these are some of their students, and they were from Georgia State. So it was really interesting seeing them on both sides of the world, really. Again, this is, these are the structures that I was pointing out earlier. The city is just, just beautiful and huge. Um, there's Dr. Chen. <laughs> he, uh, he was able to come visit for a few days, and so he got to kind of uh, show us around the place. Now at night, so the bun is kind of what was blocking the, the wall of flowers and those buildings. And so we got to take a little tour around the bun, and at night the city just lights up. All of the buildings have lights on them, and it's just incredible. Um, some of them even have messages on them, um, and this would change um, very periodically. So here's the Pearl Tower again at night. And just this bridge would change colors. Again, it's just completely lit up sky. It's incredible. This is a little shopping area that we were able to go to near our, um, near Shanghai where we stayed. This is again that bridge. This uh, I think is a good picture of the Pearl Tower too because it just, it's incredible. Um, some of us were able to go to the Shanghai Museum. So this is a picture of Robin taking a picture of the ceiling while we were there. Well, I didn't go, but they went for this while they were there. And this is really, it's hard to tell from this picture, but this piece of wood is probably about this big, and it's made out of one piece of wood, and this man carved every single bit of this, and, and by every single bit, I mean like there are tiny, minute little details in this carving that I can't even pick, I can't even imagine facial doing myself. Expressions. Yeah, facial expressions, yeah. eyebrows, I mean it's incredible, so, and I know it's hard to set up to, um, hard to see, but it was just um, so this right here, so I told you that the Jin Mao Tower um, is, I think, like in the top five right now in the world for the tallest tower. This is what they're actually constructing right now. You can kind of barely see in that picture that they're working on it at the top. But you can see architecturally it just like kind of twirls as it goes up, which is really interesting. All of these buildings that we were looking at just were interesting to, to look at. So it was just great. But this one is taller than the Jin Mao Tower, so this is actually going to be probably in the top one or two, number, number two. two. This will be number two in the world once it's finished uh, being constructed. So this is just a video um, of us and some of the Chinese students playing cards because we just kind of, we got to know these people, we fell in love with these people, and it was just a great experience overall. We'll just let us play for a minute. There's actually two different card games going on. These are people in our class. Oh yeah, there are people in our class, not just random people. <laughs> so yeah, we, we would have class and then on certain days we'd go to their cafeteria and eat with them. So we got to socialize and we taught them how to play, um, if you've ever heard of the game, BS, but we renamed it Shay Shay. <laughs> and so... Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it.